Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. What does it mean to be a Christian? I mean, practically every day. I mean, to be a Christian, we know, is to be a believer in Christ, to be redeemed, um, to have redemption. But what does it mean practically um, in our everyday life? Think about what your day tomorrow is going to be. What will you do? Where will you go? Who will you see? What responsibilities will you have? What will you buy? What will you read? Watch? Listen to? What are you looking forward to tomorrow? What are we looking forward to Monday? What are we not looking forward to? What temptation might be waiting for you on Monday? This is Sunday. What's going to happen tomorrow? Now, if you, you take that picture in mind and you think through your day tomorrow, as I think through what I'm going to face in my work day, you know, the unknown, the known, uh, the boring conference call I've got to be on every Monday, um, you know, all those things. With that picture in your mind, Ask yourself this, in regard to my day tomorrow, what will it mean that I am a Christian? How will that affect my day, my outlook, because I'm a Christian? Does it necessarily mean that this Monday should be different than any other Monday, or all those Mondays that I had before I became a believer? Does it mean my, son, my Monday, that that day should be different from my non-Christian neighbors, friends, or co-workers? Maybe even my unbelieving family. Will our day be different because we're believers? How are we going to approach that day? How are we going to live that day? How are we going to experience that day in Christ. Now these questions are, are important for all of us to ask ourselves. For those who are not being Christians for very long, it's important to think very carefully about the implications of saving faith on your everyday life. Because we are saved, because we are believers, it has an impact on our lives, or should have an impact on our lives. For those of us who have been Christians for quite a while, it's important to revisit this basic question because it's so easy to get stuck in the, the character of faith, um, in the con uh, being contented in the rut of our own making. You know, everything we do, we do things over and over and over. We get into a rut. We do it just by pure action, by pure memory. Um, by habit. So I want us to think about these questions in light of the passage that we're going to be in today. And that passage is in Philippians chapter 3. I like this chapter. I'm in it um, a few times as we've been together um, over the years. Philippians chapter 2. Let's consider, or chapter 3, Let's consider how Paul would answer that same question about his everyday life, about any given Monday in the life of the Apostle Paul. How would his life be different from B.C. to A.D., before Christ to after the Lord? We're going to start at Philippians chapter 3. 3 verse 7 and read through verse 14. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for Christ. Understand, Paul was writing this 
to the church of Philippi. When we say I, we're talking about the Apostle Paul. <clears throat> but whatever gain I had, I counted it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I counted everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and counted them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind me and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now we're looking at a passage. What is What's the logical, we're looking verse 7 to 14. What's the logical place to start looking at that? Remember, Chuck's very illogical. Chuck's not normal, so we're going to start at the end. We're going to start at verse 14. In this chapter, we're encouraged in terms of the importance of going in the right direction. We've got to think, are we going in the right direction? Am I? What does God tell us in this chapter? He tells us we are if we're heading toward Jesus, the prize. Why is the prize of knowing Jesus to be held so highly? There is nothing and no one like Jesus, is there? No. As Paul says back in verse 8, knowing Christ is of surpassing worth. That is worth that surpasses anything else in value. So what does it mean practically to know Jesus? What does the pursuit look like? What should it look like in your everyday life? Few questions are more important while living our life. In fact, this question is just another way of talking about what it really means to be a Christian. What Paul gives us in these verses, version, yeah, these verses, is a vision for our everyday life. We want to hear that vision. We want to see that vision. We want to know that vision. And based on this passage, let's look at some practical and current. Yeah. Oh my goodness, this is going to be rough. Sorry, Rich, for always teasing you when, when things like that happen. You're laughing in the car right now, aren't you? Based on this passage, let's look at some practical encouragement. Because Paul uses accounting language in this um, passage, I think we could talk about these terms and these things in terms of our economy, economics of our everyday life. To be clear, Part of what Paul is talking about here is in reference to his initial conversion. But this passage also speaks of how Paul is living out his faith right now through which he was saved by grace. We see in here two things. We see count it and we see count. We see a transition in verses 7 and verses 8. One is in the past tense, tense count it. The other is in the present tense, present tense, count. One speaks of his initial faith of coming to the Lord on the road to Damascus. The other, the walking today or in his day by faith. So what's God telling us through Paul? Telling us to hear about our everyday life as a Christian. Well, if we look back, and verses 7 through 9, we learn 
that this Monday we need to throw out the me centered measures of worth. We've got to throw out being me centered. Verses 7 and 8. But whatever I gain, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Before these verses, Paul laid out in chapter, chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, a number of qualities and privileges, a number of accomplishments that served as the foundation of Paul's life and Paul's sense of worthiness. We'll go back and we'll read ahead, or read back, verse 4 and verse 5, to see what Paul was saying there. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Paul's laying out there those things that he felt in that earlier life gave him a sense of who he was, gave him his sense of worth, gave him his sense of importance. But he goes on and everything changed on the road to, to Damascus when Paul met Jesus. Gerald Hawth Hawthorne was a Greek professor before he passed on the glory. He doesn't have to imagine anymore, by the way. Um, he was a Greek professor at Wheaton College. And he had this to say about the change in Paul. At once he realized that those good things he had cherished and striven, striven for were not gains at all. They were losses that had bankrupt him. They were evil things that bent on destroying him because they made him self-reliant, self-satisfied, content to offer to God his own goodness. They acted as an opiate, dulling his awareness of his need for the real righteousness that God requires and that only God can supply. Paul said, I count it, but now I count. He didn't label those things that, that he listed in verse 4 and 5 as being second place, as being third place. He didn't say, now I've got this, and oh, but remember, I have that there that really helps. No, he didn't um, lay those out in those fashion. He calls them losses. And more that, than that, he calls them rubbish, as our... Um, ESV calls it, he calls them rubbish, trash, excrement. Some translation even translate it dung. That's what Paul is thinking of as his old life and all those things that made him important and self-worthy um, in his life. Estimations of those things. Don't translate the worthiness before God. We can lay out our Christian resume or our post-pre-Christian resume before God, and we'll find the same thing. Pre-Christian, I was a good person. I looked out for my neighbor. I took care of my grandmother when she was, was sick and on her deathbed. Um, I read my Bible. Even as unbelievers, people do that. And they rely on that. I've been good. And so that's the worth that they find in themselves. For some, it's the worth of their job. 
I started at the bottom and I climbed and I fought and I worked my way all the way to the top of the chain. They find their worth in that. But all that means nothing. Paul's not alone. We all struggle with that me centered worthness, measures of worthness in our lives. Tomorrow, you and I will be tempted to look at those things, to long for those things that are around us. We want to be smart. We want to be likable. We want to be productive. We want to be stylish. We want to be capable. We want to be independent. There's not anything necessarily wrong with those things. Those are not the center of our life and surely not the center of us uh, being believers, being Christians. For some, that'll mean conforming to the life around us. For some, it'll be rebelling to that life around us. For others, it'll mean standing out in front of the crowd. And surely not for me, some of it, it'll be being normal. That's not me. I'm not normal. We're not going to allow those things to lay out who we are in the Lord. In fact, as Christians, we have a whole lot of things that fall into this category. You see, the Bible is full of right things that we can do. And sometimes we do them for the wrong reason. Things to say, things to pray, ways to pray. Ways to pray to make us think better. Oh, God! When it's really not our purpose in our heart, but we have that big King James prayer because we want to look religious in front of people. When you're with your coworker who's sick and you say, can I pray for you? Great thing. But then you go out into this big flowing prayer that makes you sound spiritual. While some of these things might be pleasing, they cannot make us worthy to God. There's a lot of things that we can do that pleases God, but doesn't make us worthy. We're told in Scripture to pray without ceasing. We're told in Scripture to feed the hungry. We're told all sorts of these, what we call Christian service things. These are things that honor God, that please God. These are things that don't, however, make us worthy of God. In fact, as Christians, we got to ask, why will we do what we do tomorrow? Why, when Monday comes, why will we do the things that we do? Why will we act a certain way, not act a certain way? And remember, our, our search for significance in that God tells us we might count all these things as rubbish, as dung. If we do not, we're not on our way to gain Christ. Not our salvation, but gain that relationship. This is true when we first come that Christ is a believer, and it's true every day. The me-centered measures and being sufficient of and the sufficiency of Jesus are mutually exclusive. If we admit that we're penniless spiritually, Jesus has unimaginable riches for us. If we believe we have something, even if it's just a penny, our hands will be way too full to take what Jesus has for us. 
the paradoxes of Scripture. So what do we need to do tomorrow? What do I need to do tomorrow? Throw out that me-centeredness of worth. But there's more in verse 10 and 11. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his suffering, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. We need to treasure Jesus and his gospel as our daily and only hope. Just as we talked here before about Paul counting everything as lost or rubbish in order to gain Christ, what does that mean? Well, clearly this gain is the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. Jesus. And talk about value. Talk about priceless. We should gladly throw everything out in order to gain, in order to know Christ. Throw it all out. Throw it on that rubbish heap. Get rid of it. The first thing we might say about knowing Jesus is indicated by the titles that Paul uses in this passage um, for, for Christ. Jesus, and his titles most often, often six times were Christ, and once his Lord. Remember, Christ is the title of lordship, related to lordship. You know, it's the Greek word um, that we translate to the Messiah or refer to as Messiah, the anointed one, the coming king. That's what Paul is referring to. But if you know Paul's life story, you know the only reason Paul is causing is calling Jesus the Messiah is because of revelation. Because Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. You know, remember the story is walking, and all of a sudden the bright light shines down, and it's Jesus asking why he persecutes him, and that is his time of converting to belief in Christ. But in the same way, knowing Jesus must always begin with revelation through God's Word. That's the revelation that we have received. God has given us revelation through His Word. That is our Damascus Road. We'll serve Him. We'll pray. We'll worship Him. And the way that Paul expresses this here is the language of the gospel. That's the language language laid out in the word to bring us to belief. Our road to Damascus. So, Paul goes on to explain his desire for an ever-deepening knowledge of Jesus. It's not that Paul on the road to Damascus had the light and became a believer, and that was, great, I've got it all. No, he wanted to continue in deepening um, that knowledge. And he did that, and said that he did that through the realities of Christ's suffering, his death, his resurrection, those three things being the gospel. This is not at all unusual for Paul. This is the prize he was pursuing. Remember verse 14, we're heading towards the prize. The prize he was pursuing. But just listen to other places where Paul writes about this same experiential knowledge. In Romans chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, we read, We were buried therefore with him in baptism unto death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Romans 6, 4 and 5. And in Corinthians, the first chapter of, of Corinthians chapter 2, for as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. 
in chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians 10 and 11, we are always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. For we who live are always being given over to death, death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal faith. Bless. So I think Paul is reminding us here in Philippians, and God's reminding us through Paul that our greatest treasure is to experience every single day as new life in Christ. It's not a life based on that me-centeredness, of feeling worthy, of feeling self-sufficient, of feeling accepted by the world around us. No, it's based wholly on Jesus and becoming like Jesus. We move from knowing about Jesus to knowing Jesus by eagerly speaking, seeking, and earnestly submitting to the life he wants to live in us. We know Jesus because we suffer, because we share and we have faith and trust in his suffering, in his death, in his resurrection. We know people, really know people, by living life with them, living through what they go through experience what they experience. I'm going to throw a name out there. Commander Brian Kesselring. Kesselring. Anybody heard his name before? But I guarantee you, and you do know of him. If you wanted to get to know him, Be kind of nice, maybe. Hi, hey, Brian. Let's go out for coffee. Sit down, kind of chit chat. Know what what he likes, what he doesn't like, what's his life like, and we get to know him, right? But it'd be quite another thing to be with him when he does best, what he does best. You see, he's the commander and flight leader of the Blue Angels, the Navy's flight team. And I promised that we would get to know him a whole lot better and in a very different way if we were sitting behind him. When he threw the thrust of those engines down and we went running down the runway and lifted off the ground in that F-18 and climb up to 10,000 feet going 600 miles an hour, and we're zipping and we're zapping worse than any roller coasters, and I hate roller coasters, you know, and we're doing that, and you look out, and there's more F-18s right on your wingtip. I guarantee we know a whole lot more about Brian than just sitting down and having coffee with him. Because we're sharing and what he does. As we should be sharing in the suffering and the death and the resurrection of Christ. That suffering, that sacrifice, that risen from the death is what Christ does best in his love and his glory to God in order to redeem us. And it's only living in this with him, in his power, that we can truly know him. Dying to sin and to self. Rejecting the world's way. Resisting the devil. But in that emptying of Christ, there's power from Christ that is ours. Paul knew that there was nothing better. And that can be our Monday. That can be ours tomorrow. The last few verses of this, this 
passage we're looking at. Verses 12 through 14. Not that I have already obtained this, or am ready, already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind me and straining forward to what lies ahead of me, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. Truly treasuring the prize of experiencing the suffering, the sacrifice, and the uh, risen Christ means that we'll be true, true as treasure hunters. We've heard those people who have given up everything because they found there's a shipwreck over there, and they want to find it, and they want the treasures that are found in that shipwreck. And they give up everything. They spend all their money putting together equipment to make the dive, putting together the people, the resources that are needed to find that sunken treasure. Back in the day, people did that during the gold rush, left everything behind, forgot their home back in wherever so that they could go and pan for gold and reach that treasure. Paul does this. Same thing, but the treasure is knowing Christ. He leaves everything else behind. Paul spent his every day with this prize in mind. He couldn't express his total commitment any more than in the language laid out here in those three verses. He left behind being the big cheese of the Pharisees of being everything that the good Jewish boy should be. He left that all behind, and he pressed towards the surprise of Jesus. He expressed that same desire earlier in the book, in the first chapter of Philippians, beginning at verse 18. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Probably the most remembered verse out of Philippians. Second being pressing toward the prize. Do we have a holy ambition when it comes to knowing Christ? Are we, are we ambitious to learn, to seek, to live every day? To have the kind of mental, emotional, and spiritual money to spend on Christ? Every day we're tempted to spend money that we have in our mind, in our spirit, <clears throat> in our emotions on something. And sometimes we're on a worldly budget. Paul talked about those accounting terms. Count it and count. Are we counting? Are we count? Or are we in the process of count? All this should sound familiar. This whole concept should sound familiar. Because telling us that tomorrow morning we need to go all in and do it every day for Jesus is laid out for us in the words of Jesus himself. Mark chapter 8, <clears throat> verse 34. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Because of what God has shown us, I hope that we 
all wake up tomorrow and say to ourselves, today, I need to throw out our me centeredness. I need to treasure Jesus and his gospel as my daily and only hope. I need to spend myself in light of the hope. Find who we are. Show who we are through Christ. And if we do that, if we struggle to strain to figure out what it means to apply it in our lives, in our mind, in our take our, our, our mind and our feet there, everywhere in the situations that we face, whether they're good, whether they're bad, whether they're happy, whether they're sad, um, whether it's things that we desire or not. If we take that, we'll not be disappointed in Christ. So where does the comfort and the courage and the confidence come from for such a different life? It comes from the very truth Paul probably tearfully confessed in verse 12. Not that I have already obtained this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. I press on. We start it with verse 14 as the prize, because we want to know where we're going. The Olympics are going on, and when they go on, Oftentimes, this passage is used. There's, for the track and field people, there's a ribbon across the lane. And that's their prize. They're striving. They're doing everything. They have done everything in the past to get to the point where they can hit the prize. That's the prize of our Christian life. That's the prize. Mm -hmm. that Paul was running in his race. That's the example that God gave to us to live and to run our lives. Running full out for Christ. This Monday, may God help us to live in light of that precious truth. Conclusion. Verse 7 through 9 basically said we need to throw out the me-centered measures of our worth. Verse 10 and 11 said we need to treasure Jesus and his gospel as my daily and only hope. And the last three, 12 through 14, I need to spend my life in light of that hope. God, may our Monday be honoring and glorying to you. May our Monday find us sold out to you, not leaning on our Christian resume, but leaning on you, leaning on your sacrifice, your death, your resurrection, your suffering. May all we do be about you, and not about us. In your name I pray. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday School begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.